right, Roland. So who are you? And can you tell us a little bit about your background? This is a question that we got many years ago, and I just love starting off with it because it's just so brash. Who are you? Well, I think um, I like to think of myself. Um, I'm a black man, first and foremost. I always like that's how I feel. Um, but I'm also like I have a a door experience. I was born in Cameroon, um, Central Africa, and then I came here when I was about 11 or 12, and then I got the you know experience America. So I um, you know just coming into just being an immigrant and then also like being the first in my family to go to high school, go to college. I like to think of myself as a, like, you know, just a first generation of first generations for my family. And yeah. Okay, that's good. So from Cameroon to United States, what age did you migrate to the United States? Um, you immigrate to the United States? Uh, I was probably about like, I want to say 11, because um, that'd be 2000 and 2002. Because I remember coming here, like it was right after 9-11. Like 9 11 had happened, mm -hmm. and I got here in February. Okay. Well. So, uh, kind of going off of that, um, like growing up, what, what kind of were your, your influences in terms of what career you might want to choose and what ultimately decided, um, made you decide that you wanted to go into medicine? That's a great question, actually. Um, it's funny because, like, you know, I sit here now in med school and I'm just like, it's like, yeah, I know I wanted to be a doctor, but at that age, being in Cameroon, I think I wasn't really exposed to a lot, you know. Um, I wasn't exposed to a lot. My my mom at the time, she was still um, in secondary school, I guess, which would be the, it would be like high school over here, more mm -hmm. or less. So my mom was still in school and then my dad was over here. So I didn't really get to see my dad often. Um, so at the time, I really didn't have any like aspirations. Like I didn't, I couldn't see that far, to be honest. Like I couldn't see that far, you know. Like I was just like, well, I'm going to get through um, primary school primary school which is the equivalent of elementary school here and then like i'll see what happens from there like that was that was really like you know how i looked at things um it wasn't until i came here and really got a chance to really like see the possibilities of things that i could become but um i just didn't have that like when i at a young age so i can't really sit here and be like you know when i was five i always knew i wanted to be a doctor like mm -hmm. I, I didn't <laughs> You know, like I did know school was important because my parents drilled that into me. So it was just more so thing like, I know I have to go to school, but as far as like a career path and everything, I couldn't see that far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So during your your uh, like teenage years or early college years, did you have any heroes or people that you were inspired by that helped motivate you to this pathway? Or was it solely just intrinsic? Um, it was actually intrinsic and it's like, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. I think a lot of the times, like just, you know, us coming up as minorities in medicine, it gets really hard to actually have that direct um, influence in your life or someone who's actually in the field. I think things might be getting better now, um, but like for me, it was all based on like personal experiences. Um, I think the thing that really triggered it for me was that when I was in Cameroon, um, the, you know, the hospitals, they don't have the best equipment there. Um, just resources aren't the best. So like, it was just common knowledge that like, hey, going to the hospital, like you might not come back or like, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. And I think like what really like pushed me towards this field was um, back when I was in high school, I wanna say I was a junior and my grandmother, um, I hadn't seen her since I left Cameroon. And when I came here um, to America, she came to visit for the first time. And when she came here, she ended up having um, some complications ended up in the hospital here at Washington Adventures mm -hmm. um, for a few months and then she got better and then she ended up going back to Cameroon because her um, visit, visit, visitation had been overstayed. So she went back to Cameroon and then she ended up passing away from malpractice back there. Um, and then like I found that out like because like, she died on my birthday and I remember being in class. And I think like after that, it just started making me start thinking about like, okay, like healthcare and just health, like, you know, like, like, is this, is this how things are supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know? And that's when I really started being like, okay, maybe this is something I want to do. So I, I, I think that's like my first, like, okay, you know, the healthcare, the healthcare industry and maybe trying to be a doctor, you know, that's when it really like, that was like the first thing I, I thought about then. Okay. So that was during high school, you said like the yeah. high school. Okay. Uh -huh. Wow. 
So moving on to then to uh, when you went to University of Maryland College Park um, and you were a pre-medical student, what was your experience like as a pre-med student there um, going through your classes and all that kind of stuff? Okay, I'm going to be as transparent as possible. I think when we have these conversations, I think um, it's really important for people to be transparent because absolutely, I don't, I don't want people thinking that you need to go into college and have a 4.0 to get to get to med school. But at the same time, I also don't, don't want them thinking that like you can just go in there and not really work hard, and then uh, things to be, you know, and also make it. But as far as transparency goes, like I always told myself that like you know when I get to the point where I make it to med school and I get asked about like my journey, like I'll try to be as transparent as possible with numbers. Because a lot of times people are just like, oh, I didn't do well. <laughs> but like, you know, it's just like, well, you know, like quantify that for us so I can have like a way to compare what I'm going through. So um, I actually went to Fosbury from, um, so I went to Northwestern High School mm. to Fosbury. Okay. At Fosbury, um, I don't know whether it was like the curriculum itself there or, whether I just was more focused there and like I was away from home and everything. And so over there, like I was able to, like I did pretty well, like my first two semesters. I think I had like a 4.0 the first semester. Hmm. Second semester, I think it was like a 3.6, 3.7. But either way, I did that. Then I transferred over to Maryland. So, you know, leaving Fosbury, coming to Maryland, that was like a huge adjustment because Fosbury had at the time, I think like 5,000 people, 6,000 people. You know, you come to university, I had 30,000 people, mm. very fast paced. I, I would like to think that the rigor was just very different. The way you were tested was very different. I remember my first semester at the University of Maryland, I had a 2.5. And I was mm. just like, whoa. And like, I had never like in my entire life, you know? And obviously it was a mix of things, transitioning from one university to another. Um, at the time, I was also dealing with a lot of personal issues, but I think I just also did, I just wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that rigor. I mm -hmm. just, you know, I wasn't prepared for the rigor or I knew the techniques of how to study to really like, you know, excel there. So it took me a little bit to um, really get started at Mountain. What was your major in undergrad? Um, so I was a public health major. Okay. But I didn't start out as a public health major. That's in it. Cause I went in there as letters and sciences. And that's, you know, because when you transfer to Maryland, you have to then, if you're trying to get into an LEP, which is the limited enrollment um, programs, you have to meet the prerequisites. So I thought I was going to do biochemistry until I think it was that first semester of, I think it was Chem 131. I was just like, yeah, I'm not doing biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely, yeah, I definitely had that experience too. I came in and I was like, bio? Mm, no. And then that, that, semester when I came in, they just started public health science. So I jumped on that quick. <laughs> Great major. Great major. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about your transition um, starting at Maryland. I wanted you to, I wanted to see if you could dive a little bit more deeper into your challenges and how you ex exactly overcame those. What type of strategies did you take and efforts and stuff to maneuver through Maryland? Um, I think the first thing I had to do is like, I have to be honest. Um, I had to just be like, hey, like, it's not working out. I have to be honest with myself. I have to be honest, like with my friends. I think a lot of times you being in a class with your friend and like you're not doing so well and they're not doing so well, but like you guys, because you guys aren't necessarily like communicating about how you're doing, mm -hmm. like you just go, you just get by. So I have to be honest with myself. Um, and, and then I was just like, all right, like this isn't working. And I think one of the biggest challenges, honestly, was um, the workload, but then also like just being able to apply what you're learning in class. Like I would go to class and I think I would pick up the concepts, but I wouldn't do practice problems or I wouldn't know how to get practice problems. And then, so you end up thinking you really know the material, but then you get, on the exam, it doesn't really show that, but then you're still studying, you know? And so what I started doing, um, and it, it wasn't until like honestly end of my sophomore year, going into junior year that I started like, um, doing the tutoring program. I forgot what the tutoring program, um, I think it's math success. I think they also- well, Math success, yeah. All right, so mm -hmm. I would do programs like that. And then, um, yeah, I think that was that was really all I did, honestly, like was just trying to get tutoring, um, but that was about it. That's good. I like that you said that you were honest with yourself. I feel like a lot of times, a lot of people wait to the last minute 
and they just struggle and keep that inside and they don't make active steps. But being that you were honest with yourself, you saw you reflected and you took some course of action and that course of action is seeking out tutoring at Math Success. And I actually participated in Math Success too. And that helped me through Calc 1 because that was that was challenging for me. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I think, and it's, you know, just looking back now, like I know a lot of times we talk of um, lack of resources. I mm-hmm. think... I think there are times where you do have the resources, right? But like that's a mm-hmm. line, like knowing how to utilize the resources. Like at Maryland, I wouldn't sit there and be like, well, dude, like, you know, resources weren't available to help me in whatever class. Like, you know, obviously every time they always they're always gonna like, you know, have room for improvement, but they have resources. It's just A, being aware of the resources. And then B, after you're aware of the resource, how do you utilize this resource? You know, um, so I think that's also like you know, looking back, I'm like, that was a big thing that I was like, oh, um, you know, I wish I had more help with that. And I think our second thing was, I think we need more, um, for as far as like pre-med advisors, I feel like we need more pre-med advisors that are also catered to students that aren't getting the 3.7, 3.8, like where they can have a plan. Cause I felt like, I personally felt discouraged to go to the pre-health, uh, to the, to the, um, pre-med advisors um, when it came time to like try to get um, a recommendation letter or stuff like that because it's like oh well you know I didn't do well in this class and that class and like I don't know how they're going to be receptive of me like are they going to so then I ended up just not doing that Mm. you know so that brings me to this question because I know at Maryland it's a huge university where um like you said, the transition into a school where it's like 30,000 people. At any point in time, did you feel like there was an imposter syndrome um, that you felt in the classroom um, that hindered you at all? Um, it's actually weird. So like, I don't, I never really felt like I didn't belong. I like, I just, I never felt that. I think um, were there spaces that made me feel uncomfortable? Yes. Did I feel like I was less than my colleagues? No. I was just more so hard on myself. Like, why am I not getting this? Like, I'm spending the time to do this, but I'm not getting it. And yeah. I think it was just more so about, you know, because I went through high school, like, I wasn't really struggling in high school. High school was just, I was just like, all right, you show up, you do the homework. Chances are you'll be okay. You know? <laughs> More or less, more or less. Obviously, like, you know, not to downplay high school, but I'm just saying, like, you know, more or less, like, college is obviously more various, especially when you're taking, you know, like, these strong foundational basic science courses. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I never felt like I didn't belong, but I definitely, like, felt like I could do way better, you know. And so that that's, like, more so in the self-doubt range during college. So, like, did you... How did you overcome that specifically? Because I know a lot of pre-med students have moments where they doubt themselves whether or not this track is actually for them. And if not, like they feel discouraged and they can't go to an advisor like how you said. So how did you actually overcome this negative feeling of self-doubt? Okay, so I think, first, I think you're always going to have doubts. And Mm -hmm. again, this is just my personal experience, uh, like experience and opinion, right? You're always going to have those kind of stuff. Like, you're always going to be, like, scared about things. Like, you know, it's just like, hey, I didn't do so hot here. Like, can I really do this? Like, you know, is this something I want to do? I think that, A, like, I just have to accept that. I was just like, hey, like, you know, this is hard. And just, you know, you have to come to acceptance with that. And then I, like, gave myself time. I was grateful with myself. Like, um, for example, um, because I wasn't doing so well in, like, some of my pre-med courses, and then I, I remember I had to like withdraw from withdraw a semester from school because I had a lot of other stuff going on. Mm-hmm. So then when I came back, I was just like, okay, since you know, like it was hard before, what I'm gonna do now is just try to take rather than taking three of these classes at once, let me take one and see how I do. And then I did that, it worked. And I was like, okay, so it's not that I don't know how to do this, and it's not that it's impossible. Mm-hmm. It's just that I'm not preparing properly. Like, that's just what it is, right? Like, I'm not preparing properly, nor did I put in the amount of time necessary. So, like, for me, I guess it's like I had to take a step back. Right. I had to take a step back to get some a different perspective. 
Um, um, so that's what I had to do. And then obviously I spoke to, um, I have a friend, uh, uh, ben, Benjamin Simmons, or Dr. Benjamin Simmons now, because he just graduated from Georgetown. And, um, you know, like I have friends who have gone through the track, like just been pre-med as well. So you talk to them and it's just like, you, but you have to find people that can also relate to what you're going through, right? If you're getting a 4.0, like if your science GPA is a 3.9 and I'm here struggling with a, with a class, I can come to you like, you know, hey, like get a pointer. But as far as like trying to explain to you what I'm going through, you might not necessarily understand that. I might need someone who like had that kind of struggle, but then overcame it. You know, like, so if you have anyone like that, like even coming in, if you're a freshman, that's why like mentorship is so important. You're a freshman and you have like a junior or a senior that you can just ask questions to. Like, right. hey, that, that helps tremendously. Facts, facts. Oftentimes I feel like a lot of people go into this path thing is it's going to be a straight shot, a straight trajectory up to the mountaintop. But nah, man, it has a lot of dips, a lot of pivots, a lot of glaciers coming down. It's just, and you just have to overcome. You got to keep fighting, keep climbing and persevering. And it seems like that's what you did throughout undergrad. And it definitely shows. Yeah, I know, definitely. I think it's it's definitely not a, I mean, you know, some people have like, everyone's journey is different, obviously. Um, I think we all have plans in life about how we want things to be, but a bigger part of that is also that there's also accepting that things are not going to go the way you want it all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's just more so how reactionary are you? Like how flexible are you to things? And like for me, it was never, um, am I going to get into med school? It was just like a win. I used to always tell myself, that. I was just like, well, it's just when, like, when am I going to do it? Like, you know, okay, I have to do this. Great. I'll do this. Like, I just, I like to break things down into little steps. Right. At one point, um, like just to go back to my journey or whatnot, like at one point in undergrad, like when I graduated, I still had, I want to say like four or five of my prereqs that I hadn't done yet. And I also wanted to like, because I had been out of, because I graduated in 2015 and then I'm just starting med school in 2020, obviously. So like I had a, a huge space in there where I took classes and I said, like, hey, one class at a time, just one class at a time just do it one time if you can just break things down to smaller pieces it doesn't look as daunting today's podcast is sponsored by mission to medicine a lifestyle brand that represents high achievers who are pursuing and actively living out their dreams of being healthcare professionals check out the latest merchandise online at www.missiontomedicine.com use discount code mission to medicine 10 to save 10 percent off your purchase and then things become, you know, more encouraging. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the things that we talk about actually a lot on the podcast with our different guests, because um, uh, a lot of people, like Akeem said, come in come into undergrad, maybe thinking that it has to be a straight shot. You have to go straight from undergrad to medical school. And that's the way most people do it, which is actually the contrary, especially now. Um, so kind of going off of that. Um, that time that you had in between graduating in 2015 to ultimately starting medical school at Georgetown, um, what did those years look like for you? And what did you feel were the benefits of taking that time um, and to develop yourself before actually applying and then ultimately matriculating um, as a student at Georgetown? All right. Um, so before I say anything, like I just want to say that those years to me, I feel like they're the reason that I'm at Georgetown right now. They're the reason that like I have excelled the way I have. Like I am so grateful like i would never go back and change change anything mm. like some people look at it like oh you know five you know four years that you could have been in school but for me i'm like that four years is what made me ready for school right now like mm. and that's not to say that anyone who goes in directly there's anything wrong with that you know you were just ready at that moment for that to work for you you know but me personally speaking though, though that four years, that space in between really matured me, really gave me an appreciation for what it is I'm going into and made me really understand that, okay, like, you know, how this is going to work. So um, when I graduated in 2015, I I was actually home for like just three, four months just trying to figure out right, what, what my next steps were because I hadn't finished my prerequisites. So I couldn't really directly apply to a post-bac program because a lot of post-bac programs, they required you at the time to have done your prereqs at a minimum. And then maybe some require MCAT, some don't. Mm -hmm. And I was, at that time, like I knew of like the GEMS program, which I ended up doing. And I also knew of like the Drexel program as well. But regardless, I couldn't do anything because I had to finish my prereqs. Mm. Um, so what I did is I started working as a behavioral um, 
a behavioral technician and I was working, I had clients, I'm working at children's hospital. And then what I'll do is like work and then pay, pay for classes and I'll take a class a semester. So mm -hmm. like I hadn't done physics one, physics two, um, gen chem two, orgo two. So yeah, I hadn't done those four classes. Um, so what I did is like the fall after I graduated, I took physics one at, at uh, PG Community College. And I was just like, all right, I'll take one because I'm working full time and just take one course, see how that works. I did it. I got an A and I was like, all right, cool. Now that I know that I can do that while working, then at that time, then I decided to go to Bowie. I would have took the class at Maryland, but it was just, it cost more to take them at Maryland. And because you're a non-degree seeking student, you're just taking classes. You have to pay upfront in full. Hmm. Like there's no financial aid. There's no like, you know, you have to pay for it. All and right. so which kind of also limited the amount of time. I mean, well, increased the time it took for me to get everything done. So I couldn't take like three classes a semester. I would have to come out of pocket for it. And like, I have to pay for everything. Right. Um, so I basically just work, work, take physics one, work, take physics two. Um, Bowie, I did the same thing, took Orgo two, um, took physics one, and I mean, took, then took physics two over here also. And then um, I did immunology. And I think I did a biochem course too. So like all in all, I think I did about like about 26 credits, got like a three, nine. And then that like set up everything for me to then mm. like, like now I can like apply to, uh, um, to a program. And then also I had to take the MCAT, which I, I took that like in a month between like studying and working, I have like a month space. So I took that and then put everything together. Mm. So uh, what program did you wind up going to? And then how did that prepare you for um, being a first year medical student at Georgetown? Yeah, so I applied to the GEMS program, uh, which is the Georgetown Experimental Medical Program. Um, so essentially, the program is, it's hard to describe the program. It's really hard to put GEMS into words, but let's just, it's, it is a post bank. Um, it's a post back with strong ties to Georgetown, obviously, but nothing is guaranteed. And essentially what the program does is that it helps you develop your basic um, science foundation, foundational skills and your application skills. And then you then get a chance to actually take the medical courses with the meds, the first year med students. And depending on how you do on those medical courses, you get invited to an interview if you do well and obviously meet the other criteria that they put forth, like being professional, um, things like that. And then after doing that, um, you know, if everything goes well, then you interview, like I interviewed, and then I ended up getting to Georgetown. And as far as preparation, I mean, the GEMS program really taught me how to, like it taught me how to re like to study and like refine my study strategy. So it's been very beneficial for this first year. Yeah, so that that's really awesome to see, like, you know, from your experience at at Maryland and then all the way going through the post back and then everything and being able to fully apply and then start. Um, I think that just shows a tremendous amount of determination. And I think it just shows anyone that like, if you really want something and you're really focused on getting it, like you can make it happen. So that's awesome. Definitely. It sounds like a lot of sacrifices took place during that gap year and it definitely paid off for your transition into going from gems into M1. How did, how did you feel you felt prepared um, for the coursework for um, your MS1 block? Um, I guess it's a testament to like the GEMS program. Like I felt, I felt really prepared because like, you know, like throughout the GEMS year, like I made sure like for me, and you know, I'll tell this to anyone, like if you end up doing a post back, like you have to do, you look at it as do or die. It's not do or die. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's do or die. Like if you don't, you know, if it doesn't go well in the post back, there's still a lot of there. So many people who are like, you know, they might have not done one to post back. They're still in med school. They found a way. So I'm not saying it's do or die. But like for me personally, I went in with that attitude. So it just allowed me to just excel in everything. I was literally like, OK, like I need to be on this. And I was. And so in doing that and in seeing the results of that, like, you know, when you really like put forth the work and everything and then you actually see the results of it, it gives you more confidence. So coming to my first year, I was just like, well, you know, I've seen how this curriculum works. And so like, I'm, you know, and I know like my study strategies now, I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses. So going into first year, like I knew kind of like a little bit what to expect. And um, I mean, the first block went pretty well. I'm still waiting on my grades for the second block, but I think all in all, like it definitely like went well and I felt really prepared. 
I did. How would you compare uh, the medical school blocks to UMD's course load? Like, how would you compare that? I feel like that's just like anybody in any med school. I think they're going to be like, <laughs> oh, they give you like an eon in undergrad to learn stuff. Like, you know, they gave me <laughs> like, and it's funny, you know, because looking back, I'm just like, I used to be in, you know, at Maryland, like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Like, um, <laughs> like, this is so much. You want me to know all of this. And then it's just like your first semester of med school and something that you might have learned, you know, like that might have took like an entire semester in undergrad or two semesters in undergrad. The professor is coming and got through it in a week. And maybe <laughs> and he's like, just. He's gone through all of it. And you're just sitting there like, bro, I didn't like, you know, I don't have a PhD in this. But so it's like, I don't think med school is like technically like I don't, like so far anyway, right? Like at least for my first month, I don't think it technically it's like technically hard. I don't think it's technically hard. I think it's the volume. Mm -hmm. It just bombards you. And then you have to be smart about how you study. You have to be smart about what you're going to pay attention to and what you're not going to pay attention to. So it's a lot a lot at once and i think that's the hard part of, uh, about it mm. yeah i think a lot of people like you say would agree with that statement but that's good that's a good su summary of it yeah so kind of going off of that uh the the transition and one of the things that's unique about um, your class and everyone with in your class is that you all did that transition during covid um so you had to do online learning um and pretty much all your, all right, I'm assuming the majority of your interactions were virtual. So how was that adjustment um, to going from, you know, you're used to taking classes in person. Now, all of a sudden you're starting medical school virtually. What was that like? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I think um, it's just hard. It, it's hard to, like, it has its pros and its cons, right? The pros are that you don't have to wake up and like get ready and like rush the class and go through traffic, whatever the case may be. But then the cons of that is like, yeah, like you said, you don't get to meet your classmates in person. So now, like, for example, my class, I, I you know, because I did GEMS and I know some people who like got in from the GEMS program with me. However, as far as like the rest of the class, I know a few people, but like, you know, you don't have that like, like that uh, group collaboration, you know, because you haven't gotten to meet these people. You don't really know them. Like I get into the breakout Zoom uh, room today. I'm like, oh, wow, this person in my class. <laughs> like every day there's a new person that you meet um so i think that that was really hard and i think a lot of like you know i guess i'll speak on like some of my classmates experience a lot of them felt isolated a lot of mm. them felt like um you know they were like really lonely and it was really hard like it's really hard trying to be in med school and not having that group dynamic and that interaction so i think it was it, it was a hard transition but i mean we made it possible just like you know with everything in 2020 you just had to <laughs> Yeah. What so did you, you all? Oh, I was just going to say, like, did you all have any like ways of trying to like combat that? Like, do you still feel like a closeness or like, you know, how did you all kind of go about combating that sense of isolation? Uh, I mean, our, you know, with the group me, we have the group me. We're transitioning over to Slack now. We tried to, we had like a, I think this is before the semester has started. We tried to do like small group, uh, small group gatherings with people, mm -hmm. like uh, less than 10 people. Um, so, some folks got a chance to really meet some people um, and whatnot. But as far as other things, I think that's about what we had. I mean, you have the different student organizations and stuff that, you know, you can mo try to meet people there. But like, honestly, there wasn't really that much that we did, honestly. Like it was just class and maybe like in your small groups, you see these people and you're just like, all right, cool. But yeah. we're still figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, de I definitely commend anyone who started medical school in, in 2020, because uh, that's a huge transition in and of itself to start medical school. But on top of that, starting uh, virtually and every, all the uncertainty surrounding it, I really commend all of you all for who were able to do that, because it's really tough. I appreciate that. Reflecting back, because now you're about to start block three. You say you're going to start tomorrow on block three. Reflecting back on block one and two. Um, what do you think was like the hardest lecture content so far um, that you're just surprised by? I never ever see ID, infectious diseases. <laughs> Not gonna lie to you. Everything like, so I think um, here at Georgetown, like block two is like, it's known to be like a really hard block. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's the block that 
you have, I think that this black cell, you have immunology, um, infectious diseases, um, this pharmacology in that block as well, and some evidence-based medicine. Um, I think because of how Georgetown sets it up, where it's just like we have exam blocks, so like you go throughout the entire block, no exams, and then you have a you have a week where you have like four exams back to back, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to like somehow study for everything. I would say like infectious diseases, like trying to know like all the bacteria, like you know what class they fit in what antibiotics work for it, you know, what they cause, what they're resistant to. Like, that was just so much. Like, I had the Anki. Like, I'm not the Anki person. I was literally <laughs> on Anki, just like, all right, let me get my head around this. So I think for me, personally, that was, like, the challenging thing. Um, everything else was pretty straightforward, but that was, is the volume of it was a lot. Okay. It was like a lot. Do you like using Anki? Um, oh, no, I'm not the big, I'm not the biggest fan of Anki, but I do know that it works magics for whoever <laughs> does it, but I'm not the biggest fan of Anki only because like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge conceptual learner. Like okay. I'm a conceptual person. Like I love concepts. I love to just, all right, this, this, then the third. That's why like, I, like, I really love phys physiology because once you understand the concept, no matter how you change things, you know how the concept works. And so when I use Anki, I think sometimes I like, it's disjointed for me. Mm -hmm. um, where it's just like I'm just making associations but like I'm not there's like an overarching picture here that I still need right um, but I guess I've learned that like I just need to watch the lecture and then Anki later so that that kind uh, of that solves that issue that makes sense that makes sense yeah uh, it makes sense. I'm not surprised that you, out of all the, the the semester, I'm not surprised that infectious disease was the time where you decided to, to use Anki because, like you said, it's so much information, trying to learn all the different drugs and the bugs and and all that stuff. So, if there was ever a time to use Anki during medical school, it's definitely infectious disease. That's for sure. Um, so, kind of going off of the, the school stuff, um, obviously you're very busy, and like you just said, you you study really hard, and, and medical school is a lot of work. Um, so what are some of the ways that you've tried to maintain balance and de-stress amid a busy school schedule? Um, so I play soccer on Sundays with mm. some other folks. Um, well, this was, yeah, so we play, we play uh, soccer on Sundays. Um, I, I work out, but block, so I kind of really fell off with that, but like typically I'll work out and then, um, I play a lot of video games too. People be like, oh, you're not gonna have time. I make time for the things that I need for my mental health. <laughs> I, I, like I'll make the time, you know? So um, I definitely like, I will definitely put on my game and play after like looking at a few lectures, I'll do that. And yeah, I like to run too. So just little things here and there, you know, just to take yourself, take your mind away from school just for a bit. That's yeah. A, that's overwhelming. I got to take you up on that tennis match. Oh yeah, and I play tennis too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that's good to stay active i know a lot of people like it could be difficult like you said um it's difficult sometimes because especially when you have a busy school schedule um you know it's hard to to think of spending time outside of studying and and doing things that's not related to school but you know I, i've i've found that it could be valuable in terms of just kind of refocusing yourself like you said and just you know de-stressing a little bit and then coming back a little bit more focused to it yeah no definitely it's it's very it's very necessary um Kind of touching back on something that you mentioned earlier, I know you mentioned about Cameroon and the health disparities that exist over there relating to your grandmother and malpractice and whatnot. Do you see any health disparities or social issues in the U.S. or back in Cameroon that you want to tackle as a physician? And also, are you considering any specific specialty right now that you want to pursue? Oh, he came with the big gun questions. I like that. <laughs> All right. Um, as far as just like health disparities, I think... It, there's like a laundry list at this point, you know, um, I think um, a big one for me, I would have to say is healthcare navigation. I think like I've, like I've said already, right? I think there's a lot of resources now going towards making more resources available to the um, underserved communities, right? But the thing is that like you can provide those resources if these people don't know how to use them. It, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if I don't know how to if I don't know how to get online and check my insurance benefits or know how much, you know, what I'm covered for a particular drug or whatever. I'm not going to go take it. It doesn't matter if there's a pharmacy next to me, you know. So I think that's a big thing. Um, something I also really care about is what both of you guys are doing. And that's trying to increase the, 
you know, just increase my, just increase like underrepresented uh, folks in medicine, especially like black men. Um, I think there's like a huge, huge cry for black men in medicine now. Um, and I think in my class, there are about four, four of us out of like 218, I want to say. Mm. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's very important to me. Definitely very, very important to me. Um, yeah. And as far as specialty goes, it's funny. I was told that, um, you know, they'll ask like, oh, what, what are you interested in? A lot of times people are like, well, you know, I'm open. I'm open. Um, because like, you know, everyone always wants to play it safe, which I, I, I understand. I respect it. Um, like for me, though, I, I can really see myself doing surgery. Um, I can see myself doing surgery. But that's not to say that, you know, like I'm not open to other things. I think um, when you finally get a chance to really like go on rotations and see these things, then you're like, I feel like you really have an idea of like, that's something that you can do for a long period of time, right? Like, right. I think a lot of us come into medicine a bit naive thinking, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this. But like, you don't know, like, you, you, you know, you don't know. So it's, it's like, I, I would like to do surgery um, or something cardiology related. So mm. that, would, that would touch on your concept maps and physiology, tying everything together. Let's see how that works. Um, Post COVID, so now we're in 2021 and hopefully this year we can have some normalcy with, you know, the vaccines rolling out and hopefully we we'll see over the next couple of months how that goes. But in post COVID world, I know you're a big music lover, you know, during that you're de-stressed, you listen to a lot of music. What concert or artists you would like to go and see post COVID? Post COVID? Oh man, that's hard. Um, <laughs> shoot. Post COVID. I would definitely like this. I would like to see uh, J Cole if he drops something. I would. I wouldn't mind going and seeing Cole. Like that. Would, that. That would be nice. That'd be nice. I'll go see Cole because um, I haven't seen him in a long time. Um. Yeah. I, I would definitely like. I. I would leave it at J Cole. Like I would like to go see J Cole. Um. For sure. <laughs> nice. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's a wrap. Yeah. That was yes. pretty much it. Yep. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Take some time. Uh, we know this is valuable time, this rest time right before you start your uh, your third block of first year med school. So we appreciate it, man. Uh, thank you guys for having me. You guys are doing like really good work. Like this is this is pretty dope. Awesome. Thanks.